So you think you or someone you know might have autism spectrum disorder? Let's find out. Autism spectrum disorder has been recently one of the most talked about disorders in the public domain. And a lot of parents will look at their kids and think, I wonder if my child has autism spectrum disorder. They're doing some of these things that seem representative of that. Or an adult, as they start to learn about autism spectrum disorder, starts to think, some of this stuff applies to me now and when I was a kid, I wonder if I have autism. So here's what typical standard autism spectrum disorder looks like. There are going to be two parts of it. The first part is difficulty communicating or interacting with others socially. And we're gonna break that down into three more specific areas of social communication skills. The second part has to do with restricted or repetitive behaviors, interests, or activities. And we're gonna break that down into four subcategories that have to do with that. Let's break down the difficulty communicating or interacting with others socially. The first one is difficulty with social emotional reciprocity. Now, what is social emotional reciprocity? That's when two people are interacting there's no real practical reason oftentimes for having a conversation with someone other than the social bonding that occurs. If you're trying to get information from someone or you're problem solving together, that's one thing. But if you're chatting with someone about a trip that you took or telling somebody a story of a situation you were in, people with autism spectrum disorder tend to not be interested in hearing about other people's situations or life events unless it it's, there's some reason or it's a topic that they're highly interested in or it's full of facts and data that they would like to know about. The opposite's also true. If you tell somebody with autism spectrum disorder, hey, I heard that you went on a trip to Italy last week, their response will oftentimes be something like, yep, and that's it. They, they don't see that that's a social cue to share some stories. They really don't care if you know what happened on their trip or what they experienced. People with autism spectrum disorder don't seem to have much of an interest initiating friendships or starting interactions with others. And when others try to interact with them or initiate some kind of a conversation, they equally don't seem that interested in reciprocating. That's where the word social emotional reciprocity comes in. Number two out of three is difficulty with nonverbal communication. You might not notice this, but when we're talking, we're using facial expressions. We're changing our tone of voice. Uh, we're using hand gestures that go along with what we're saying and they, and they sync up. When you talk to somebody with autism spectrum disorder, they're either talking in a monotone or sometimes they'll have a, a bit of a high pitch, something that just seems a little bit odd about how they're talking. Now, I'm not saying that to make fun of anybody with autism spectrum disorder. I've just spoken with a lot of people with this, and I've noticed that that is a common one. It doesn't always occur. A lot of times it's more with, with children that you'll hear that sort of sing-songy voice it's referred to as sometimes. The third social factor related to autism spectrum disorder is starting friendships and maintaining friendships and even understanding how friendships work. A lot of times you'll speak to a child with autism spectrum disorder and I'll ask them, do, do you have any friends? And they'll say, oh yeah, I've got lots of friends. And then I ask a few more questions and I find out everyone in my class is my friend and my teacher is my friend and my mailman is my friend. Then you start to get the idea that, okay, this, this child doesn't quite understand the difference between people being friendly and an actual friendship, relationship with someone. Or when they start a friendship, they don't quite understand that it takes time to get to know somebody and that you act a little different with them the first few times you meet them compared to the next few times, compared to when the friendship has been going on for a while. They kind of start right off with, we're best friends for life, um, right at the beginning, and it can be off-putting. Adults with autism spectrum disorder usually have either no friends or a few close friends who understand that they are a little bit awkward uh, and maybe sometimes uh, people with autism spectrum disorder will befriend each other because they understand a little bit more and they're a bit more forgiving of some of the social faux pas that occur. Hey, I just wanna jump in here real quick and just remind you if you like the video and you wanna help out the channel, please click like. 
and press the subscribe button if you wanna see more content. I'm coming out with more and more videos. Hit the bell and you'll be notified when they come out. And now let's get back to it. Now a person with autism spectrum disorder would not only have difficulty in the social realm, but also they would show signs of restricted or repetitive behaviors. Now what does that look like? I'm gonna go through four different categories and a person with autism spectrum disorder would generally show at least two out of these four. So we've got number one, stereotyped motor movements, use of objects, or speech. So stereotypies are things like repetitive movements, either rocking back and forth, maybe pacing. Uh, it's a little bit different than just being fidgety or like the leg bumping up and down. That's not really what we're talking about. The other stereotypy could be speech. They'll repeat the same phrases over and over again, almost as if it's from a script, or they'll recall uh, movie lines or TV show lines, and they'll just start saying them even when the context of the situation doesn't warrant it. The other one that you see usually in small kids is the use of an object, repetitive use of an object, rolling a ball over and over and over again, spinning around a lid, uh, like a pie, a pan lid or something, spinning it around over and over again. And then when it stops, spin it again. When it stops, spin it again. Closing a door and opening it over and over and over again. You know, All kids will do that a little bit to some degree, but when you start seeing it as a, a pattern, that's indicative of potential autism spectrum disorder. Number two in this category is insistence on sameness adhering to non-functional rituals or routines. People with autism spectrum disorder want things to be the same. They don't mind having the same lunch every day over and over and over again, or wearing the same clothes or the type of clothes over and over again. They prefer that, they like it. It's typical human behavior to like routine, to like to know what's expected. It's the amount of distress that is caused when the routine can't be adhered to. The average person can usually go with the flow with some mild discomfort to some degree, but the person with autism spectrum disorder, it's going to really be a necessity to stick to this routine and the amount of upset they feel will be much more than a person who does not have autism. The third one is restricted or fixated interests. People with autism spectrum disorder tend to have one or two topics that they just love and they know all the data they're the scientists on this. It could be birds, it might be robotics, it might be World War II weaponry, something that has lots of data and facts and statistics that they can learn, baseball scores and statistics, uh, things like that. Usually it's science oriented, but it doesn't have to be. When you see it in small children, it'll be a topic that most kids aren't that interested in, but this kid just loves that and they'll go on and on. They'll be telling you all the data and the facts, even to the point where people are done with it and it's a little bit boring and it starts to almost be socially awkward that the person is still going on and on about this topic of trains or something scientific that they're interested in. Trains is a really popular one for some reason. Now, if your kid likes trains, that doesn't mean they're autistic. All kids like trains and trucks and stuff like that. But if you find that that topic keeps coming up, let's draw a picture. Okay, it's gonna be trains. Let's talk about a story. Okay, it's gonna be trains. Let's read a book. Okay, it's gonna be trains. Then you're maybe on to something, but it also has to be in the context of all these other things that we're talking about. It can't just be that. The fourth one is the sensory sensitivity. Now that can be broken down into, you know, touch. Um, people with autism spectrum disorder generally don't like the tags touching their, their uh, neck in the back. They don't like the seams in their socks. Certain textures of clothing just really feel itchy and uncomfortable for them. Also lights or sounds, they're a little bit more sensitive to it. They get irked by it more. Crowded places, the mall, festivals and things where there's lots of people around can just become disconcerting. It can even be uh, textures of foods or flavors or scents that the person just really experiences with a lot of intensity and it makes it uncomfortable for them. So a person with autism spectrum disorder would generally have all three of the social parts that we talked about and then two out of the four restricted or repetitive habits, behaviors, activities, that sort of thing. 
Hopefully this has been helpful for you and you know a little bit more about autism spectrum disorder. If some of this stuff sounded like it applies to you or the people that you're wondering if they have autism spectrum disorder, the first recommendation is talk to a professional. They can get more into the history and the details and help sort it out much better than watching this video. This is Dr. Scott Greenaway signing off, saying remember, psychology works. Take care and take it easy.